Okay, so thank you everyone for being there uh, and welcome to this uh, third session of the uh, Metaphysics and Science Seminar. Today it's my pleasure to welcome Emilia Trizzo from the Kafoskale University of Venice. Did I pronounce this right? Yeah. Perfect. So Emilia now is a specialist of Husserl, but before he has worked also on the philosophy of science in practice and a lot of phenomenology. And he uh, has kindly accepted to be put to come with this uh, enemy territory to defend phenomenology against philosophy of science. So <laughs> thank you uh, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. So, as you see, the title of my paper is quite broad. Phenomenology, Philosophy of Science and the Idea of Metaphysics. So, here is a plan of the presentation. So, the talk will comprise three parts. So, first, an outline of the phenomenological theory of science and of its relation to metaphysics. Just to be clear, when I use the word phenomenology here, I mean Husserl. I mean transcendental phenomenology, so the mature approach of Husserl. Of course, there are other phenomenologies and there are other ways of defining phenomenology, but the kind of experiment, uh, comparative uh, experiment that I am suggesting today is based on Husserl's sense of phenomenology, and you will see for a specific reason, not just because I like it more, or for, for technical reason. Um, the second part is a comparison between phenomen the phenomenological theory of science and philosophy of science. Again, one could wonder here what do I mean by philosophy of science, because also this word as a broad is a broad umbrella term. But what I mean is standard mainstream English speaking post World War II philosophy of science. Of science. You will see that it's, it is important because I treat it as a discipline in its own rights, in a way, as it was, a, a, in a sense, a, a, a kind of scientific discipline in its, own, in its own right. So, of course, the name has been used widely also for, you know, through the history of philosophy. I, I will try to say something about why I don't think that the word philosophy of science should be used so widely in general. I think the word has a history. I think the discipline and with that, the institutionalization of the discipline is recent. And, and so I don't think, again, it's arbitrary to name a philosophy of science what people to do, do under uh, the, um, uh, the rubric of mainstream English-speaking uh, analytic, if you want, even philosophy of science. In any case, it's, I am talking about that. I'm not addressing here the results that, would, that you would have if you were, for instance, to explore the uh, tradition of French epistemology, which is different, and that would be a different kind of uh, comp comparative experiment in a way. Now, the third part of the talk is a phenomenological criticism to philosophy of science, focusing on the word concept. So there, the point will be to say, look, look, you can use that theory of science that has been developed by Husserl without even necessarily assuming that you agree with everything that he says, because that's a very important point, to highlight how there are certain gaps in the way in which philosophy of science develops its, its own analysis and methods. That's, that's the attempt. Now, first part, an outline of the phenomenological theory of science and of its relation to metaphysics. So if you are not familiar with Husserl works, this part will not be very, very clear because it's extremely, extremely um, synthetic. So it will be very short. Um, I'll, uh, th there are, of course, there is work on these topics. And so whoever is willing to, 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 to learn more, there, there are ways to, to, to deepen the, the understanding of this, of this, of this, uh, of this topic. Now, the title of the talk contains three philosophical disciplines, phenomenology, philosophy of science, and metaphysics. Why evoking them together in the first place? Huh? Well, currently there is a renewed interest for the nature of metaphysics, 
and for its possibility as a scientific endeavor, and this is certainly a lot in analytic philosophy, as we know, within th this debate we can identify more specific discussions about the relation between metaphysics and the positive sciences, because within contemporary metaphysics there is a debate about what the positive sciences should, um, should have when doing metaphysics. Should metaphysics be based on Science, or should metaphysics be independent of the results of the science? Or should, should metaphysics be in between, etc.? So these debates, insofar they involve scientific knowledge, they involve also philosophy of science, because the area of philosophy in which the nature and scope of science becomes an object of investigation. It has to be like this. That's why this triangle that I have there is justified, actually, not yet, because you would wonder what, why phenomenology is there, and, and of course. It is because it is well known that the aim of Husserl's philosophy was from the outset to bring about a scientific metaphysics that would encompass both the metaphysical issues that are closely connected to the positive sciences and those that are not, at least not prima facie. So those that are not, in, in the words of Husserl, would be theology, immortality, the, the sense of history, all these things are metaphysical and they were precisely his ultimate goal while developing his philosophy under the rubric of the highest and ultimate questions. You know, but he has this program of building philosophy von unten, that's the, that's the motto. So you start from, the, from basics in a sense and then you develop a systematic philosophy and what are the, the, the highest religious existential moral problems are the last. In between, you have metaphysical issues that are connected to the sciences, and we will see how. And this is important to, 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 to remind people, because sometimes today this is not a common perception that people have of phenomenology. So today the phenomenological approach is sometimes thought to stand in opposition to metaphysics instead, or to be completely independent of it. Or something that there are people who have argued that phenomenology and metaphysics are two dependent problems. Other people think that phenomenology, and again, I'm talking about the, the original version, is somehow anti-metaphysical, etc. Perhaps the reason of this is that some see a contrast between the objective interest of metaphysics, and if there is something that has an objective interest, it must be metaphysics. If we intend metaphysics as the study of the most general and ultimate structure of reality, Mm, that's. And on the other hand, the allegedly first personal approach of phenomenology, you know, uh, so there is somehow a kind of perception that, that I would like to, 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 um, to overcome in a way that, that they are really two different things there and that there is an opposition between the two. So this is to justify why these three disciplines, <laughs> these three broad, broad disciplines are brought together and also to um, as you imagine, to, to, to warn you that we will remain at a very general level because that's precisely the kind of operation that I'm attempting here. And so it's, it's deliberately a, 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 a consideration that remains at a very general level. Now, now, the reasons why, and I think everybody could be interested in this, whether you like phenomenology or not, the reason why phenomenology can cast light on the current debates on metaphysics. And I say cast light in the sense you, you will see what, what it means. Well, first, Husserl developed an account of why the project of modern metaphysics has failed. And when uh, this is modern metaphysics, we see modern metaphysics from Descartes to German idealism. And if you want the most mature and most interesting account of this uh, history is, of course, in section you know, two and the beginning of the part two and beginning of part three of the crisis. It's not the only one. There are other courses in which also speaks about this before. It's nothing new in his philosophy, but there it's really beautiful how he deploys the, the history of the collapse of modern rationalism, basically. And now, second point that one should, should so, so the, the first point is that look, there is somebody there whose plan, who has, who has a view, if it thinks that we live in an age, philosophically speaking, that is defined by the collapse of modern metaphysics, basically. And the second, he thinks that transcendental phenomenology constitutes an, an attempted solution to the crisis. 
more about this later. And that the current, the third reason I would say, is that the current predic predicament of metaphysics can be what you can quickly, what emerges quickly by, by reading uh, some of the articles in the, in the, in the handbook of metaphysics, for instance, uh, can be explained in light of uh, phenomenological categories as a result of the crisis and fragmentation of philosophy. So that's, that's always, so we should move on. Now, what is then, is it number, sorry, yes, so that's the next one. The crisis of philosophy. So what we find at the heart of Husserl's critique of culture is the notion of crisis of philosophy, of which the so-called crisis of European sciences is but a consequence. This is an important point that is often overlooked. overlooked. The crisis of the sciences, it's not something that happens for a logic that is internal to the sciences. It, it is in their relation to philosophy that they are said to be in a crisis. Now, how does Husserl characterize this crisis of philosophy? Who's let's say, whose moment of eruption is between Hume and Kant, if you want. Uh, uh, that's really when things are, um, when the disaster begins. Uh, it is the dissolution of the ideal of an authentically scientific philosophy with an absolute foundation. That's the point. A philosophy that it includes all theoretical, axiological and practical disciplines as its moments. So. This, the, the pattern is quite clear. This is the guiding idea of modern philosophy. This idea undergoes a process of dissolution. We, li we live in the aftermath of this dissolution. And the crisis of the sciences is a consequence of this. And often, obviously the crisis of culture at large, because of course within the unity of the syst systematic philosophy, also the axiological and normative disciplines were included. So philosophy in this ideal of modernity had to be the guide of European civilization, the guide of a rational humanity. Nothing less than that. And so the, the crisis of philosophy is also the crisis of European culture. And why is philosophy in crisis? Well, that's where it becomes, of course, much more technical. But in, in, in broad stroke, it is the dissolution, the dissolution of this ideal is the result of the inability of modern philosophy from the Cartes to Kant and German idealism to correctly address the general problem of reason, understood as the correlation between the reason and what is in the widest sense. That's the problem. So if you if you go through the different, there's not much on German idealism, no? so if you, you, that's a bit disappointing. But if you go through the different chapters of, of also reconstructions of how th this dissolution of philosophy happens, basically the underlying theme is always the same, is that we have lost track of the fundamental way in which being becomes rationally posited and known. That's the that's point. Now, the failure, this failure is in turn a consequence. So, okay, this is the failure. Why? <laughs> in a word, the failure is due to modern objectivism. So, what is objectivism? Objectivism is what was injected into modern philosophy by Galilean, what Husserl takes to be the Galilean mathematization of nature. So the idea that um, following the, the intellectual operation of the mathematization of nature, nature has been turned into an ontologically self-sufficient being that signals it itself indirectly through perception. This has not been uh, understood um, by Galileo. He did not understand that what he was, basically to put it in a very simple way, Galileo, when he mathematized physics, he kind of thought that he was unveiling a word in itself. The moment, basically the, the gesture <laughs> to mathematize, to access a word that is mathematical in itself is almost like the disclosure of the word in itself, because the rest 
is it's just a subjective appearance of the world. It's in our head, if you want. In. And this filters through the cart, and, and the cart unites this conception which is objectivistic, so it, it thinks being it's something that is self-sufficient in itself. It filters into the cart in the notion of res extensa, in its split with the res cogitans, in, in, in modern dualism. So basically, the cart is responsible for uh, building a metaphysics that is itself based on, on, on this objectivism due to, to Galileo. This is really a short, uh, if, if there are questions here, we can, we can go back to this, to this problem. It's interesting that, it's, that, that the history that he makes is really coherent because all the, the, the steps of the mm, collapse of modern philosophy, so British empiricism, Kant, it's, it all comes from there. It's, it's very, very coherent. In a way or in another, it's sort of complicated history. But the point was lost at the beginning. Descartes had the good idea. He wanted to do a universal philosophy with an absolute foundation, but he could not do it because of, of, of the objectivism that had infected his, his philosophy. So he could not situate the subject as the, the, of knowledge in a complete radical way. Um, so, a theory of reason would have been called upon to guarantee the groundedness and transparency to all rational activities of our culture, from the most abstract to the most applied sciences. It would have provided rational norms for human action in every domain. Now, the remedy in the eyes uh, of Husserl and such will remain our situation until the full development of transcendental until the full development of transcendental phenomenology. So that's so there is a savior. It's also that's the mission of phenomenology, is to bring back our culture as a rational philosophical culture that is based on a philosophy that has absolute foundation, and this philosophy can have legitimate absolute foundation because can, it can address the problem of reason in a radical way, and to address the problem of reason in a radical way is to avoid any objectivistic presupposition and to, to assess knowledge in its where pure subjectivity can be investigated. The pure subjectivity of which phenomenology talks about is where you can encounter knowledge without being bogged down by objective, objectivist hypothesis. That's the sense of the transcendental reduction. That's the sense of making a phenomenology that is pure and transcendental and making it into the Archimedean point of any consideration about rationality. And that's, and that's why the, the, the method of phenomenology is the transcendental reduction, because it's the only way to access this Archimedean point where a correct theory of reason can be built. So I hope that now, okay, so in this time of crisis, what are the sciences, the sciences that exist? Now, in this there is a difference with Descartes, the Descartes on the uh, discourse de la méthode. Is not, Descartes is really saying, apart from mathematics and geometry, there is little around that can really call the science or be convincing. Also, does not, although there are a lot of analogies there, but also, also it's, it, it lives in a different situations. The positive science, at least a large number of them, exist and they work and they, and they are successful. And um, also it certainly does not believe that the science in crisis is a completely irrational activity. The sciences in their current state, so the, the, the sciences in a sense that are what? They survive after the collapse of philosophy. That's the idea. They are like, they are like detached branches from the tree of knowledge that somehow still a little bit uh, sprout <laughs> but they are not really, really attached to the branch of knowledge. That's the idea, no? <laughs> or, or um, there is a, anyway. Uh, there are many metaphors uh, that, that can describe the situation. The sciences, in their current state, are called by Husserl theoretical techniques. And that's an interesting notion. There is activities endowed with a method capable of discovering truth. Be careful but incapable of determining its sense. Of course, this makes sense only if you understand what it means to discover something true without understanding its sense. And for this, you need to understand the theory of constitution. 
but it can be done. The simple example is provided by modern physics that for Husserl is not of course, he's aware that there, there are revolution, theoretical revolution in modern physics, but, but one can uh, formulate true or compelling claims about, let's say, the motion of bodies, while completely missing the sense of being of material nature. I, I just want to elucidate this. So, what is a theoretical technique? If you are more familiar with philosophy of science than with, 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 uh, with, with mainstream philosophy of science than with uh, Husserl phenomenology, well, I mean, Husserl's problem is not the problem of scientific realism here. So, in, in, within philosophy of science, one would say, well, we know for sure that sci the Star Wars sciences are successful, usual arguments, so arguments from success, predictive success, explanatory success, technical applications. Does it follow that the theoretical claim put forth by the science about what is observable and unobservable, most of all, also are true or even uh, close to the true in any way? Uh, that's the debate. You, you will never find this, this consideration in the text by you will never find anything like this. Because basically, for him, the convincingness of, of the sciences is internal. There is, there is an internal convincingness of the sciences. So if you study classical physics, you see that it's a rational enterprise that makes absolute sense, and it in some areas is completely confirmed, empirically, obviously, confirmed by experience. Now we know that classical mechanics is not the way to do it, and that it's... But the new physics that we have for, for him works in the same way. You do it, you put yourself in that attitude. If, to the best of our knowledge and to the best of our experiments, that science works, well, but that, that's what you should believe, in a sense. So, so for him, you could also say, he could also simply say, look, sciences disclose us a lot of truth, end of the story. And yet they are theoretical techniques. And yet they are not really genuine sciences, and yet they are not really philosophy. Why? That, that would be strange, because today many people say, well, if you, if, you, if you give up the idea that, you know, if you accept the idea that these sciences are truth, yield truth, in a way, then you have what you want. The debate over scientific power. Now, here is the problem, is that you can have this theory, the scientific theory, the same body of James, huh? For him, this is completely portrayed and represented by the great classical philosophers. We can ideally imagine a very similar, at least we know that it wasn't like this, we know that the different philosophers had disagreement about physics, too, obviously. But you can take this night of physical knowledge by itself and say, look, you can see it. So you can see nature as a substance, self sufficient. One thing that is ontologically independent from the thinking substance, which is itself ontologically independent from the from the from the from the substance. The, the same uh, knowledge you, you can see it in in, in, in the way Locke did. And in, in this case, the situation is changed because actually you see the scientific theory, but you refuse to interpret physics as the science of a known substance, because whatever it is that nature ultimately is for Hume, for, for Locke, we don't know. We can be Berkeley, and then all of a sudden, all this knowledge remains there, but it becomes purely instrumental. As you know, he's the father of the first instrumentalistic interpretation of physics, as Popper himself, himself said. And, and basically what you have is that ontologically speaking, nature is dissolved into ideas in the mind. As everybody knows, because because the material substance is removed, and so ultimately physics speaks only about connections of ideas. You can have Kant, and at least under certain readings, what you have is that the nature that is the object of physics is just is but a representation. It's but a, it's a phenomenon, but it's not something that exists in itself. So this is another reinterpretation of the being of nature. All of these things are called 
by Husserl, interpretation of sein interpretation, sein's interpretation. Those are in interpretations of the being, in this case, of nature. Similar consideration about the psyche, about the social world. It's a bit more complicated. So those are interpretations of the being. Now, the point is that this interpretation change completely the nature of your worldview, regardless of the scientific correctness of your claim. And that's what it is, and, and, and it's only on the basis of this, inter okay. That's for short, is okay. a situation of a theoretical technique. So in a sense, one can put it also in this way, you know, if you take physics today, it works very well. The fact that there are other avenues in which people deny the validity of physics, uh, they, they develop different in ontological interpretation, they speak about unknowable words in itself that cannot be reached by physics. Precisely the fact that there is no clarity on these issues shows that these sciences are not really, really sciences as they are. Because through them, we don't have an unquestionable, unquestionable, transparent grasp on being. True science will exist when all the rationality, all the rationality that belongs not only to the activity of the scientists, but to the knowledge claims that they put forward will become transparent, completely transparent. And then you really have a science. Otherwise, you don't know what you're talking about, in a sense. Although you make true claims, but you don't know what you're talking about. Now, now in this slide, there is what I have condensed is Husserl's entire theory of science. to be a bit unclear. But who's a theory of science? I use the word theory of science because it translates Wissenschaftstheorie, and also because I don't want to use the word philosophy of science when I speak about Husserl. <laughs> it will become clearer and clearer that that's precisely the, the, the kind of operation. So I want to use another word, which is his word. The word philosophy, the Wissenschaft, you don't find it. <laughs> I, can, I can assure you. <laughs> Husserl's theory of science is based on two cardinal distinctions. One, one is the, the, between the factual and the eidetic. The eidetic is the way in which Husserl deals with the notion of a priori in general. Any kind of claim about a priority are translated into claims about not eidetic knowledge, essential knowledge. A factual instead is the opposite, is the knowledge of facts. And the other cardinal opposition is between what is objective in the broader sense of the world. So what is transcendent in the broader sense of the word, and what is transcendental, so what concerns pure, pure subjectivity. Okay, so in this sense of objective, the facts of nature are objective, but also, also mathematical theorems are objective, so they are not, of course, about transcendental subjectivity. Now, let's concentrate on the phenomenological theory of science that concerns the sciences that are about the factual and the empirical, so natural and social sciences, the Tatsache Wissenschaften, the sciences of facts. How do you provide a phenomenological grounding of these disciplines? Well, <coughs> the theory of empirical sciences mm, consists in the elucidation of the factual knowledge the latter produce by virtue of eidetic disciplines that have a science theoretical function. Wissenschaft, theoretic function. These, these disciplines are in turn of two types, some are objective, and here and there, and they are Wissenschaft theoretic. What, what means that objective? Well, formal logic, formal ontology, ideology, mathematics, all the set of formal disciplines as such, they, are, they provide an a priori stock of knowledge for empirical knowledge, of course, also is not into debates about whether quantum mechanics would force you to change a bit parts of, 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 of logic, <coughs> but I don't think much would change in that respect. And 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 they these disciplines have a, why do they uh, why are they theory of science? Why precisely because they, they they belong to the rationality of all scientific disciplines. So there's no science without logic. 
you know, science that, that doesn't use principles of, of formal ontology. In addition to that, there would be, of course, quite agreed upon by most people, not everybody, but most people, there are another set of a priori disciplines that are instead much more problematic, that, that, that are the ones that Husserl called material ontology instead. They are a priori, they are eidetic, but they don't make claims about any object whatsoever, they make claims, a priori claims, about the different domains of reality, nature and culture, being the widest and most important one. And within nature, of course, there is physical nature and living nature. Now, this has a very, very important role in our theory of science, and I must say, also quite problematic. It's one of the parts that, that can be more legitimately criticized, I would say. But they are extremely, extremely important in this, uh, in the, in this function, in the sense that, that take uh, material nature, for instance, well, material nature revolves around the notion of a body, of a thing, mm -hmm. and, 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 and in this, what, what an, an a priori eidetic analysis, and we we'll see how kind of traditional is this approach, will, 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 will highlight three fundamental components of a physical object, time, space, and causality, and then different disciplines will develop mathematical forms for the theory of time, the theory of space, and the theory of causality. So, um, all of this, as now in principle, all of this is not phenomenology. These are objective a priori, and they have this function. Now, the second level of Husserl's theory of science is transcendental. It means what? It means that is where you study instead the acts, the intentional activities, in which any possible object of knowledge is constituted. Where any possible object of knowledge is not randomly this or this or that, but is precisely objects that are formatted according to the, the categories that are in the other section. That's why the two things go together. The constitution is always a theory that has chapters, and the chapters of constitution correspond to different types of beings. And the different, the different types of beings are investigated by, by formal and, and material ontology. Now, a transcendental phenomenology of reason investigation to the a priori correlation between reason and being, and that's, and that's the ultimate theory of science. So, basically, the point is to embed an empirical science into this universe of a priori truth in order to give the transparency to its methods, to its claims, and to the being that it, it, it investigates. Now, of course, when I said that I made that list, that's perhaps we, we no, I, I mentioned this in a, in a second. How does this connect to metaphysics? Yes, I have to, what, what is, why is metaphysics in the picture here? Because so far I say, okay, this is a rather mm, extreme foundationalist approach to scientific knowledge. What has got to do with metaphysics there? Right? Well, Rousseau has a certain notion of metaphysics that, that is his. And it's actually, he thinks, did I skip? No, I didn't. Basically, he thinks, and I'm gonna read this text because it's quite clear. He thinks that his way of putting it is not that we do the sciences, and then on the basis of the sciences, we build some kind of me metaphysics with, you don't know how, basically, with whatever methods that you have. This is not his idea. This can have a sense if you talk about the other metaphysical problems that I mentioned before, the ones that are, have to do with God, with, that, 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 then it's a different story. But if we stick with the first level of metaphysics, it's quite clear, Husserl doesn't think that once you have done the sciences, then you say, okay, now we have done the sciences, and now we do metaphysics. He thinks that the aim of the phenomenological theory of science is to turn the factual science into metaphysics. So once, once they are grounded in that way, they become metaphysics. That's, that's his claim. Of course, it, one has to understand why you would use that word. Yes. Yeah, just, uh, why, what does he, what does Husserl mean by ultimate? 
Is it certain or is it... Uh... Yes, it, it, it's, it, it, it makes sense. I have a slide on that because that's a crucial question. So how would you know that that, that, that's, that is ultimate in a sense? And, and the, first, the claim that he makes is that the aim is to turn science into metaphysics of actuality, which means hmm, something beyond which it makes no sense to question or to do any research. The question is how you would know that this is the case, and on that, I must say, he's less transparent, but... Mm -hmm. in surprising me. No, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I think the, the answer is quite clear, actually, in the sense that the Constitution is something that makes sense only if there are motivations that force you to overcome a certain level of objectivity. So, for instance, quite, quite simply, so I, you are anticipating something that I'm about to say, but now, now, now I say it. Um, in the case of um, the world as it is perceived, it's quite obviously not a final description because, because there are plenty of reasons to highlight it, to, to think that it is subjective relative. So it's obviously a domain of entities that has to be objectivized. It is the usual problem of primary and secondary properties. And so it's clearly a gappy word that needs to be explained and objectified. Now, if ideally you get to the point where nature is described as a purely objective mathematical structure, and, and, and it's a coherent system of physical principles that explain everything as a purely system of mathematical structure, then what are the motivation to think that that being is the manifestation of something else? What, 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 are, what are the rational reasons to think that that being is just a manifestation of something else? Mm -hmm. That's it makes no sense. Sorry? It makes no sense to ask that question. Yeah, well, okay. Wait. Perhaps continue this conversation mm -hmm. later. But that's, 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 a, that's a crucial point to understand why he wants to use the word metaphysics for that. Because otherwise you say, okay, it's a well-defined science, it's a well-grounded science, but it has to be, it has to have these aspects of being ultimate in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so here is a quotation, a letter of 1911 uh, to William Dilthey, okay, <laughs> and where he, he defines it this way, every science of existence, design Wissenschaft, for example, the science of physical nature or science of the human spirit, turns eo ipso into metaphysics. According to my concept, according to my concept, insofar as it is related to the phenomenological doctrine of essences and undergoes from its origins a final clarification of sense and thus a final determination of truth content. The truth which is thus expounded, for example, the truth in natural science, regardless of how limited and relative it may be from another point of view, is ultimately a component of metaphysical truth and its knowledge is metaphysical knowledge, namely ultimate knowledge of existence. Ultimate knowledge of existence. Now here you skip a part. Um, the entire natural knowledge about existence, all knowledge within the natural attitude, leaves open and narrow problems on whose solution depends the ultimate defini definitive determination of the sense of being and the ultimate evaluation of the truth that has already been reached in the natural first attitude I believe I can see that there can be no other meaningful problems behind the ultimate ones, namely the constitution of being and consciousness. That's, that's the problem. Along with the rela uh, related problems of being, that therefore no other science can lie behind the phenomenological expanded and found in universal science of existence, which in its works includes all natural science uh, of existence, or rather that it is nonsense to speak of a fundamentally unknowable being that lies b behind this. Hmm? This excludes every Kantian metaphysics of the thing in itself, as well as uh, every ontological metaphysics that is extracted from a system of pure concepts that forms a science of existence of a Spinoza. There is a lot to say about this, we don't have time. Why, for instance, Rousseau refuses the notion of substance and he thinks that it's, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> now, 
I read only the, 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 the bold part. The science of facts are in themselves philosophical and tolerate, once grounded, beside themselves, no other special philosophy is being attached to them. This in mind. And uh, the universe of the world, the universal theme of the positive sciences, acquires a metaphysical interpretation, which means nothing other than an interpretation behind which it would make no scientific sense to seek another. Now, I understand that this was a bit long. Now, this is, will be just say, okay, so first, phenomenology has its own way of dealing with sciences and on trying to ground in them. It's quite different, obviously. And second, it is uh, something that, in its own way, again, think that the idea of metaphysics can be reformed and rescued and reproposed in a different way. Hmm? Reproposed in a different way. Now, Husserl himself, by the way, will not always use the word metaphysics for this. Um, in, in the crisis, it's, the ter terminology is a bit different, not, not the substance. Hmm. Now, here is what I submit to you, which is a comparison between the phenomenological theory of science and the philosophy of science. So the comparison will be done precisely by putting on one part of the slide, not phenomenology as a universal science of being, but the part of phenomenology that deals with the theory of science and philosophy of science. And I will, I will here go through this kind of systematic comparison. <coughs> now. now, first, so how have I, just to tell you that I have heavily relied not only on knowledge that I had about more or less um, <coughs> precise about this or that aspect of philosophy of science, but I have heavily relied on the way in which philosophers of science present their own activities in the introduction of the textbooks of philosophy of science. I've looked at many, many of them and the way in which the discipline is introduced what it is, why we do it, what is its meaning. I think it is significant, I think it is interesting in understanding the, the identity of a discipline in general. Now, <coughs> phenomenological philosophy, let's first begin precisely by the conception of philosophy that is either implicitly, obviously, as you will see, that's also a methodological premise. What I have on the column of philosophy of science is a reconstruction of a huge variety of approaches and texts, because by definition it's not one thing. So it cannot be clear cut, because the things it talks about are not clear cut. On the other hand, it's Husserl's mind, so insofar as I get it right, that's, that's so it's, this, this explains a bit of a symmetry in, in the way it is etched around. So let's try to see if at the very beginning there is a different way of, in, of intending even what philosophy is in general. And it's clear that for Husserl, phenomenology is a system of sciences grounded on absolutely self-grounded science. So no, it cannot be clearer than that. So philosophy is science in its own right, in its own right. Some sciences are different from others, but they are all sciences. It's not just a name. Science is not just a name. And so on. Now, philosophy of science, philosophers of science implicitly perhaps rather than explicitly, but certainly do not see what they do themselves. They don't see philosophy itself in this way. As a matter of fact, as it is practiced, and in the world it is practiced, philosophy is a set of disciplines defined by the orientation of specific themes and problems, and only loosely interconnected. So philosophy of science, philosophy of knowledge, philosophy of mind, <coughs> philosophy of art, philosophy of reason. All of this is particularly true of all the philosophy of which have, by the way, a certain specific structure that is, historically speaking, not exactly the same as disciplines like ethics or metaphysics. So philosophy that are really oriented towards an explicit topic. They, they, the kind of working attitude is this. Now, of course, one would say, but brilliant, but they certainly have something in Husserl's theory of science and what I call philosophy of science have, have certainly a lot in common because they start from the fact of science, and this is true. And, well, I believe that this is true, but I believe that there is something like a mode of encounter with the fact of science that is extremely different and that has very, very important implications. 
phenomenological philosophy on one side, philosophy of science. Uh, so on the first side, again, it's Husserl's. What is the mode of encounter with the fact of science? So what is the fact of science? The fact that we live presently in an age in which there are activities that we call sciences. And, and there are. No? Now, how do they get into Husserl's philosophical discourse? At the very beginning, for instance, of the Cartesian meditation, in this case, it's a clear text. At the very beginning, in the self-meditation of the philosopher, when the philosopher is trying to define its own aim, it's not its own aim with respect to the sciences, its own aim as universal knowledge. They enter at that stage. So after the first suspension of all theories and models of knowledge and past philosophy that, that for Husserl defines the attitude of the philosopher, that it's really try to start from scratch in a way, after that, he, he claims, look, then how can I even move in a certain direction? I need a tentative idea. Where do I find a tentative idea of a rigorous knowledge? Well, it is the sciences that suggest it. And so Husserl speaks about the positive sciences experience as a nomadic phenomenon. That's what allows him to abstract some very, very basic principle of rationality, like the, the need of rational foundation, of, of, um, of intersubjective uh, evidence that can be shared. These sciences that, that he he doesn't seem as valid, he sees as an option, as a, as a suggestion, as a possibility for, as a model, a possible model of scientific, scientificity. The best way of saying it is, of course, in German, they contain itself this Zwekide. They contain itself, although in a, in a diminished form, in unprecise form, they contain in themselves the goal idea of a knowledge that has rigorous foundations. And this is what puts his meditation into motion to see whether it's possible to, to pick up this goal idea and to radicalize, to make it into an absolutely rational method, which in terms will go back to the sciences and, and, and make them rigorous again, in a kind of strange movement back and forth. No? The, the image that I like is basically that we live in an age in which a flood submerged most of the continents, and so basically philosophy of science has separated. What he's trying to do is to dry out the water and little by little see science and philosophy as part of one thing. <laughs> and so th this game, now, this is certainly not the mode of encounter of science that you find in the, in the, precisely in the way in which philosophy of science presents itself. The presence of the sciences within the social world of our age. That's, that's the, point, the point of departure. It's the present, it's people who begin by saying that in our age, in our age, there are the sciences, hmm? primarily the natural ones, that hmm, what makes them worthy of attention, what is their salience among many other objects, it is the fact that uh, in our cultural situation motivates the philosopher turning, to, what motivates the philosopher turning towards them, because that, that's the point. Because they produce what we take to be knowledge of the world. So they are seen from the spot as is tentatively as the sources of our worldview. And because, of course, our world is dominated, our life and the world is dominated by technology. And, and this is the mode of encounter. And it's quite interesting immediately to, to work out how, how this happens in a certain way, because, because what is encountered are the sciences, primarily the natural ones, precisely bec because they have clearly this kind of double performance especially the second, although in, in, inevitably, inevitably they are postulated, they are encountered in the social world because science is, is, is an activity, is a cultural activity. Science itself is not a natural phenomenon if you don't then naturalize everything, but that's, that's another story. Now, another step, epistemological kinship with the sciences. What do I mean by epistemological kinship? Hmm. Well, what the words mean in the sense, obviously, both approaches talk about science. So at the level of objectivity, they take of the science as an object. But that's not what I mean. What I mean is how much they, they see what they do as somehow 
in a relation of affinity with the object they take. And of course, here again, the situation is very different because if you, if you start from also like broad, uh, outmoded, uh, systematic approach, there is a fundamental, essential co-belonging of the sciences and the reflection on them as part of scientific philosophy. So Rousseau was doing science. The sciences are ideally internal to philosophy, which is internal science, and that's, that's the aim. The aim is to philosophize the science is to make them philosophies, parts of philosophy. Now, well, philosophy of science has a relation that I would define of externality from that point of view. The science is an object of philosophical discipline that is, is not itself a science. Um, philosophy of science don't see themselves as scientists, as to be scientists. There is here a footnote to put, which is very significant and would require a very long analysis that I will certainly not make, and that, of course, there is an alternative, which is the naturalistic program. And the naturalistic program is interesting because what happens is the opposite. It's philosophy that becomes internal to the science or what is left of it. But that cannot be the default option of philosophers of science. And it's not, it doesn't stand immediately from the model encounter with its object, and it cannot be. Witness the fact that whoever wants to naturalize has to naturalize something, that naturalization is always based on this operation, is, a, is an operator. So there is always the idea there is something that is given there that is not natural and has to be naturalized. So that's... Now, um, another point, this time I will, I will start from, from the right, because for demarcation, is in, any, in any textbook where you find demarcation, there is a chapter on demarcation. Of course, it was more fashionable many years ago, a little bit less now, but the, the point that one of the classic issues of philosophy of science is what makes, pseudo, what, what makes science scientific, what distinguishes real science from pseudoscience. Of course, Popper is the one that has made it popular in a way. And, and it's quite interesting if you, if, you, if you come from so far away and you see that, that the question it's, that is not asked there in all discussions about what demarcates science from science is what demarcates a good philosophy, a scientific philosophy for a philosophy that is not scientific. <laughs> Which strikes me as a problem <laughs> that at some point will have to emerge. And that's why I suggest, although the word is absolutely not there, that the analog on, of the demarcation problem within, within the other approach is what makes philosophy scientific, not what makes physics scientific as opposed to astrology. But it's what makes philosophy scientific. How do we identify the correct form of scientific, of philosophical scientificity? <coughs> Which is, again, goes back to the old issue of the crisis, because all the vicissitudes of modern philosophy and the collapse of modern philosophy is based on the fact that modern philosophy was based on a wrong model of, subject, of scientificity. It was a wrong scientificity because it was subject. Uh, based on, on objectivism. So obviously then you have a very limited reflexivity on the right and a very essential reflexivity to this, this, in, in this notion of demarcation, what is the stake there? You know? So the, 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 this, this philosophical question for Rousseau is, is, a, is, is a question of identity for philosophy. Again, we can make a footnote about naturalism perhaps during the debate. Now, I know what is the aim with respect to the positive sciences of these two approaches. Well, on the one hand, as I already said, it's turning the sciences into parts of a scientific philosophy, into authentic science, genuine sciences, echte Wissenschaften in German, which is resolving the crisis of European sciences, and which implies, implies also clarifying the content as method of individual um, sciences. Uh, in philosophy of science, understanding the nature and function of the sciences. It's more, it's more grasping the nature of, of the sciences, assessing their epistemic and ontological import, and clarifying the contents as methods of the individual science, the philosophy of the special sciences. It's very, very, it would be very strange, although there are some deviant cases that, that the case of Chang, for instance, would, would, would not be easy to fit in this, in this, in this, in, in this scheme, because, because he's a reformer. He wants to change the way science is made, but that's that's a, that's a strange thing in a sense. That's not the default, the default attitude of the discipline. 
And here I wrote the same because actually there is a level in which the two approaches overlap completely. If you want, if you read in, in Ideas 3, for instance, there are a number of claims put forward by users about what people should do with physical theories, biological theory, looking at their definition and stuff. It could be a research program in, 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 into special philosophy of the sciences today. <laughs> it could, it's, it's, it's because, because that has to be done anyway, so, so the, the point. Now, Relation science metaphysics, phenomenological philosophy, and philosophy of science. So, well, as I said, turning the positive science into metaphysical factuality and understanding the purpose of the meaning of the facts they describe. That is the second level. No? The second level I have said nothing about would be that once the science is around it, then the questions, teleological, theological question, the question of put in a very simple way, you know, the, 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 the point whether a certain possible word is better than another. That would be the question that you would have to ask after having grounded the science, and then you would get to that level. And this level would have a, a relevance for those questions. And, and of course, in philosophy of science, there are a number of different options. I take two extremes there. But of course, either the idea would be to say that we do philosophy of science and we don't want to go into metaphysics at all, and there are many, many, uh, and it's quite coherent with the, with, the, with, the, with the approach, in a way. Um, or on the other hand, there are, especially now as we know today, a number of people who, who instead believe that metaphysics should be built on the sciences, and all the methodological problems then are there, of course. Because to the methodological problems that belong already to the practice of the sciences, then you have to add the other methodological problems that are meant to bring you from the sciences to this metaphysics that you want to build on the sciences. Now, methods. Phenomenological philosophy, I don't even read it again, because more or less those are the methods that, that I have listed here, philosophy of science here. I put some of the approaches that have generation after generation built the, the toolkit of, of philosopher of science, so the logical analysis, historical case studies, field work, analysis of scientific practices more recent. And of course there is the absence of an explicit and unified method, and this fits perfectly with the features that I have described. Now, relation to the theory of knowledge in general. Well, the total dependence of the theory of science on the ultimate problem of the reason being relationship. So there is, it's with, within Husserl's theory of, of science, it would be madness to describe into a philosophy of science and a general epistemology. Of course, items are different. Now, I have always been quite impressed by how academically different are the disciplines that today are called epistemology and philosophy of science. I always, always say, okay, that's something very weird going on there. <laughs> something very weird. And so, sometimes somebody says, okay, philosophy of science is a part of epistemology, that's it, but you don't really see that work so much. Now, a role assigned to pre-scientific knowledge Phenomenological philosophy. Well, okay, here is another fundamental point. When you, you go to pre-scientific knowledge, and that's very coherent what comes before, no? phenomenological philosophy, essential for grasping the being of the world and the different thematic domains of the sciences, so that the role, that the, the description of pre-scientific knowledge as in phenomenology is, 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 is essential, because, because all the cardinal notions uh, like the life world, ontological regions, and all of that must be constituted before the work of sciences. It, it is the, the analysis that, that, in a sense, gives sciences their object domains. Now, in philosophy of science, this is quite minimal. So, of, of course, everybody refers to our acquaintance to microscopic objects. Everyone speaks about, about the fact that, that ultimately it's a matter of perception. Of, of, of the, that any scientific test of experiment ultimately points back to some, something that happens in the world of perception, etc. But very often, and it's not the case, huh, given that this is not, there's no central focus on this kind of knowledge, on this, what happens there is that level gets naturalized. 
and it's a kind of, not not always but it's 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 a kind of tendency that is always there and it's, it's it's not the case that this tendency is always there you've seen it in Kuhn for instance that one of the many ways in which he tried to make sense of the notions of paradigm shifts is to speak about the same stimuli that are interpreted in different ways as if the word of pre-scientific experience could be fittingly described as stimuli <laughs> which is obviously already the result of a, of a scientific objectivation of the cognitive subject. Uh, and I express a tendency to identify the word with a scientific posit that is there. So an hour is gone, and a kind of apology for this. I, I can try to continue a few minutes more. Ten, ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. I overestimated my... Okay, a priori knowledge, cardinal point about phenomenological theory, if you do philosophy of science, the problem of the a priori, it's something you kind of yeah, don't really believe or take it seriously, but that's not something you want really to, mm, to, to, to build your, your, your theory on, and that's, and that's a big question in this, in this sense. And the last point that I want to evoke is the word concepts, which in the case of phenomenology, is clarified on the basis of, of priori structures um, before science, the life word, and in philosophy of science, as I'm about to argue in the last 10 minutes, it's inherently objectivistic. So it is implicitly derived from the concepts and methods of scientific knowledge, and that doesn't mean that it's naturalistic in the strict sense of the words, so that everybody is a naturalist. But in the sense that intellectually speaking, the word concept is built like an object. It's, it's, it's like, a, it's a, I, will, I will make some obvious example. So this is, so far, it's a very broad uh, table of the differences. One, to a large extent, could also accept this and say, fine, I stay with philosophy of science and I let all that stuff go by the board because this is, this is to an extent, of course, you, you clearly see the, the, the kind of descriptive style that he has. At the end, what I want to suggest is that not only here there is a difference, but there is obviously implicitly a fundamental objection that, that the, the approach of Husserl would make to whatever philosophers of science do. And, okay, setting the goal to complete the sciences, to turn, you just read, then into metaphysics makes the being of the world the central themes of Husserl's reflection on science. Indeed, the two most fundamental, since the very beginning, since, since its pre-transcendental phase, indeed the most fundamental notions is mature foundational effort are life words and reduction. It is impossible to underplay the role of the notion of life word when comparing phenomenology to philosophy of science. The life word provides the anti-objectivistic word notion necessary to address the question or principle that concerns scientific knowledge. In contrast, the thematics focus on the being of the word as such, before and independent of science, is beyond the remit of philosophy of science. Philosophy of science is unable even to turn into a theme, let alone to overcome the natural attitude. Yet, sooner or later, it stumbles upon the need to give a characterization of the word notion. At some point, it does. And the result is not one, what one would call a scientific worldview, because that's obvious. It's not, it's not the what I mean here is not the result of the sciences, but a view of the word root of the world, of the being of the world, that is based on objectivistic premises derived by scientific thinking. Thus, philosophy of science is bound to misinterpret the sense of being of the world, the being of the life world, on the basis of objectivistic conceptions of being, or on the basis of relativistic forms of constructivism. The ontological advocates... <coughs> uh, did I not skip one? No. The ontological positions advocated philosophers of science are based on the surreptitious constructions of the world itself out of the results and methods and the conceptual frameworks of the specialized sciences. All of them are based on, to, to use a sort of technical language, of transcendences whose being is not elucidated 
not reduced, and thus they have objectivistic premises. So, physical is an, is an obvious example, that's the easiest way. If you, you say basically, what, what, the point is not what physics says about the world, but the point is that instinctively many people would say, well, if I have to think, if I have to play God, and build the world, it would mean you put together a certain number of physical facts. That's an example that illustrates perfectly this, this, this complete gap. That's for Husserl, it's just not a word at all. Not because it's false, but because that makes sense only as a description of a certain part of the life world, which is material nature. It just isn't the word. The word is just, you just lost the word on the way. Now, also the intermediate positions, that's of course the would take some time to, to discuss this in the spectrum between scientific realism and empiricism, take their starting point, the word conceived as a scientific posit in this sense, the word itself is a scientific posit. On the other hand, all forms of social constructivism, one would say, okay, but in philosophy of science, there are all this constructivism, so they, they actually dissolve, or they want to dissolve the super objectivity, but actually they are more or less conscious attempts to understand the nature of knowledge and even the sense of the word, in relation to social interaction occur occurring within communities of, communities of empirical subject, whose being is not elucidated. The social constructivism is something really bizarre if you see it from this way, because the, because the word is word and scientific knowledge, in a way or in another, are turned into social construction. But then, what is the being of the communities of subjects? of the societies that are meant to build this construction is not really understood to the end. It's, a, it's In that case, it's not physics, but it's sociology, if you want, that becomes the, that, that becomes the owner of, that kidnaps the notion of word. The word, the word hood of the word is kidnapped by sociology instead. Thus, even these apparently so unnatural forms of world interpretation are unable to break free completely from the shackles of the natural attitude. Now, conclusion. The phenomenological theory of science is not. So the conclusions are basically of more and more radical, so one can stop at a certain point, except before you say, no, no, I get only here, the rest I don't believe it. Okay. So first, easy one. The phenomenological theory of science is not just another approach to philosophy of science, it's very different. It's radically different, and it makes sense to use different words. I didn't have time, but I can also insist on this expression of philosophy of science that strikes me as, as truly bizarre as a word, actually. Between them, there is a principled opposition that's the second level. They're not only different, they, they, they go in, in opposite direction, deriving from their different conception of philosophy. And I think I have done some effort to show that at the very beginning, the different conception of philosophy itself, of what the philosopher is doing, so of the agenda of the philosopher, is decisive there. The fundamental phenomenological, the third level, is that, is that if you can use one approach to challenge the other. And what challenge would you get? But the challenge to philosophy of science consists in demanding from the latter an investigation into the ultimate problems of reason, which are precisely those that concern even the simplest posits, even positing an object, even positing my body. In light of transcendental phenomenology, philosophy of science itself is an expression of the crisis of philosophy and of its fragmentation into specialized disciplines unable to develop radical philosophical investigations. Now, of course, one could use this as a tool. So one needs not to believe that what Husserl does is completely correct, or that he has all the answer or anything. One, needs, one could simply use this insofar as it helps us acknowledge that there is something missing on the other side. That's why I don't even, I, I think I haven't done it, and I'm not qualified to do it, but I think that very similar kind of train of thoughts could be done instead of making a volume not with Husserl, but with Hegel, and see what happens there. It would be interesting. <laughs> it would be interesting. The failure to address the fundamental problems of reason becomes particularly acute as soon as the very notion of word is in question. 
But this challenge must be met should anything like a science based metaphysics become possible. Do you want five minute breaks? Yeah. Five minutes break for the public. Yeah. <laughs> five minutes of break. We'll get we'll get a good question. I'm sure.
back. We can wait for we can wait for Tony. Okay. Either way, you go ahead. We can go ahead and start. Non mais ça c'est c'est ton c'est ton style. Oui mais c'est pas grave. Je pense que c'est bien. Don't forget to say that uh, if the students want to ask in French, you are okay. In ah oui oui. Ah bien sûr. Si vous avez besoin de poser des questions en français, c'est il n'y a aucun quasiment aucun problème. <laughs> This slide, it's uh, oh, yeah, a. Well, if you can do oh, it. Oh, nice. That's very interesting. <laughs> it's not exactly because then I changed it a bit. <laughs> I did first this and then I changed. But it's almost exactly what was written before. You know, uh, self, self attempts uh, to uh, get out of this modern conception of knowledge, how uh, to get out of this uh, concept uh, of uh, knowledge uh, of as representation. But I wonder whether he succeeds mm. because uh, all this business of uh, 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 noetical, noematic uh, structure, uh, eidetic reduction, and pure uh, subjectivity. And this, uh, well, you know, these things much better than I do. Mm -hmm. But I wonder whether he, 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 he doesn't stick to a certain form of idealism. So I was, I was very uh, 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 interested and I was not surprised that you mentioned Hegel at the end. Of course, you could solve, in a way, um, this, this, this mm -hmm. problem of objectivity, saying, well, given a certain philosophical apparatus, so mm -hmm. to say, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, you have kind of a structure, a coherent, rational, transport structure of ideas, uh, 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 but uh, that is not ideas in the sense of representation, because you then we said denies that those uh, 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 things that you construct in your mind, mathematical uh, structures and things like that, or a priori structures, the deny that it makes sense to ask and whether they correspond to something external, to something objective. But then you, you, you get close to Hegel, to some kind of radical form of idealism. Don't you think? I mean, that's, uh, that's a question that... I no, no, well... Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Well, thank you. That's, there, is, there is a lot to, to, to say here first. Um, 
Gustavo, you, you're suggesting that the crisis of modern philosophy or modern theory of knowledge in that respect is rooted in representationalism. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think in, in these respects you wouldn't be in disagreement with Husserl at all. Mm -hmm. I think because the point is simply that his, his claim is that that representationalism is due to Galileo's objectivism, so that it, it just it just takes it a step a step backward, basically mm -hmm. a step before. So the the <clears throat> phenomenon that happens with Descartes is what he calls the splitting of of the world into two worlds, basically, mm -hmm. and that's and that's already then you have this problem whereby whereby the the putting together the object and knowledge becomes such an incredibly difficult problem that's it you know? so from the, this point of view i think i think uh, of course he has his way out of the uh, of the way of representation mm, it works it doesn't work i think that that we are not going to decide it here in in uh, in, uh, in 10 seconds again i think you 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 see the the, the, the most important point there in, in certain ways Husserl is an idealist, but he says that. He is a transcendental idealist. He has his own way of being an idealist. Okay, what does this mean? Of course, it's also the object of historical controversies, but I mean, when you asked that question before, I was saying, why do you say the knowledge is ultimate in a sense? Because, because within also transcendental idealism, being makes sense only as potentially constituted in knowledge, in, in consciousness. So there cannot be anything that is beyond any possible constitution of the community of transcendental egos. So, and of course, his way of talking about metaphysics stands up or falls with these principles. Because if, if you cannot make that claim, that, that is, this is the claim of transcendental so that the world is constituted down to the ultimate level of objectivity and it doesn't make sense to think of a being that is not potentially an object of knowledge basically if that falls then his theory of science could in a sense be preserved as it is but you wouldn't you would lose the, the right of saying that it is ultimate knowledge <laughs> of being because you could still imagine or suspect that there is a hidden side to the world. That is just a representation. That is just yeah. so. In this sense, yes, the 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 the, the ambition for 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 Husserl, Hegel, whom he didn't know very well, obviously, but but for for Husserl, Hegel is is just a failed attempt to do the right thing, basically. So so he he has he has especially not so much when he's young. When is it? He's older. The time of the crisis. He's he has a, a real admiration for what he was trying to do because in the end in the end the, the, the aim is absolute knowledge and 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 so the, the, the historical reference is entirely correct but I if, if if you allow because because I really would like to take up your, your first challenge a little bit further because I am interested into it and so so you said that you are a philosopher of science and that you did not see yourself fairly portrayed by what I presented. So, of co although it's not, I don't have the right to ask questions, but either in private <laughs> or now, or perhaps after the, I would be really happy to know why you don't see yourself as fairly portrayed by my, my, my description. But I say. Well, just, uh, I think I can modestly, uh, very, uh, well, actually, very immodestly <laughs> that question. I, there is a book of mine which, which is coming out in April. Okay. Uh, scientific realism and the laws of nature, the metaphysics of cause and powers, mm. in which I discuss you know, some of the points that you. Good. I don't discuss personal. You know, I no, no, no. I understand. <laughs> I understand. But, uh, yeah. That I present you know, what I think uh, is the, well. It's my view of on philosophy, on philosophy of science. Yes. Okay. But we're a pretty bizarre department. <laughs> Say again? We're a very bizarre department. A very weird bunch of philosophers of science compared to probably where you present. 
have a question. Is there question from the students? Has a question online? I have one. I have one from online, real quick. Um, Marco Casali says, uh, first of all, sorry if his questions are naive. He wanted me to say that, but. Um, could you say something more about the claim that the fragmentation of philosophy of science is related to the crisis of philosophy? He says, if I understand correctly, this crisis would go hand in hand with the criticism within science of over-specialization within disciplines. Mm -hmm. and so how could a phenomenological philosophy maybe be used to help scientific practice if there is this, this parallel? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, those are two, two big questions. So the first one, in a sense, it's easy to answer because it's, that's, that's within Husserl's point of view, what he would say about the situation which we are now. And the point is not just specialization. It's not that philosophy has undergone the same phenomenon that, that the sciences have already undergone in this age, because that would be somehow accidental. The, the problem is that the, the, the philosophy, what we call the philosophies in the plural, they, they are not investigations that try to question radically the principles that they use. So the specialization of philosophy is the creation of non-foundational philosophies that live in some professional niches in which a certain number of issues are seen as relevant, as important, and a certain number of philosophical paradigms are evaluated in a way. And that's definitely, that fits with the idea of the crisis of philosophy because it, it's, in a sense, at the afterlife of philosophy once we have abandoned the dream of a unified philosophy that has an absolute foundation, which, and as he says, within which it's not the case that I read that quotation when he says that if we had that, or when we, had, we will have that, the different sciences would be authentic, genuine, and they would not tolerate any other philosophy beside that in the sense that you don't need anymore this kind of disciplines if you have this idea of unity. So that's the first question. The second question, whether it's really that I'm not entirely sure I can provide a satisfactory answer whether phenomenology can um, uh, help. I, I, I think uh, I would be inclined to say yes and hopefully to say yes precisely because there is one way in which in which phenomenology can help the scientists to see the connection between what, what they do, and it is precisely to lead them back to the pre-scientific uh, life work in which, in which the object domains of their disciplines are found to start with. So, so basically the, the problem of the science is not only that they, they um, specialize on one thing, the problem is they, they live only in a section of the world. And, and the problem is that it's not the way in which the world is, it's not the way in which we live. And it's not the way in which science and its applications and its results interact with one another and interacts with society and with politics. So it is phenomenology can help to, to, to remind that, that actually the, the world is the place in which we discuss, in which we meet all of us and in which we decide our future. That's, that's the idea. Do we have questions from the students? The question is this year. Our questions then? Excellent. So uh, th thank you very much for this uh, comparison. I know how difficult it is to do and you have to simplify the, you know, mm -hmm. that there's a, there's a real value in the exercise. Mm -hmm. So of course I, I, I'm on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I agree with the dynastic, you know, there's some part of the way we practice philosophy of science that is completely blind to certain things like the concept of the world and like that. Mm. But, but when you say, you know, maybe we should go back to the problem of reason, mm. I, I get really scared because it's not for nothing that philosophy collapse. It's because mm. maybe we were too focused on reason and not on looking around what is happening. So, but I was, I was, I was, maybe a way to get on in the direction for philosopher of science without going back to UCL is, mm. for example, the, the distinction between epistemology and philosophy of science mm. makes no sense at all. But you would agree that, that it Yeah, it makes no sense no. that this divide. I'm teaching both, it makes no sense. You agree that it exists <laughs> in, in the practice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and it makes no sense, and you're right that in a discipline like epistemology, even 
anglophone epistemology. Mm -hmm. you know, and we're closer to a reflection about uh, that is closer to reflection close to Husserl, not with all the baggage of Husserl, mm -hmm. but maybe the the way Russell was reading Husserl in the nineteen something, mm -hmm. and and we don't lose the part of the subject, we don't lose the part of uh, being in the world in ordinary epistemology and the connection to the social. And when you switch to philosophy of science, all these reflection that is still progressing you know, disappear. Virtual epistemology disappear. Social epistemology disappear in, in the actual, in many of the actual philosophy of science, even when they say they, they take into account practice. So may, maybe, I don't know what, of course it's, you defend yourself and you want to, us to go back to read yourself, I don't understand that, but, but in a more modest way, maybe just reconnect epistemology to philosophy of science will enrich the, the both discipline and make discussion about, for example, the concept of the world less. You know, the world is a, is, is, is a mosaic of facts, I like it from a certain aesthetic point of view, but it's clearly limited. Mm -hmm. So, how, what do you think about this more modest? No, but that that's more I, modest. Of course, I have a different interest, but I mean, I, I would like to to be anyway. Of course, yes, in the sense that if you see the the, it's what I was trying to do before, basically. If you if you follow what I said, you can accept to a point. And I said there is really, you can simply also, and this is what you would be inclined to do, you can use phenomenology as a volume, basically, you know, to say, look, actually, this kind of more classic and rooted in the tradition approach to knowledge, you can say, they, it addresses a certain number of issues we don't anymore. That would be more of what you're suggesting, if yeah. you understand. And then perhaps we can find a way to address them. But and that's a, without necessarily yeah. going back to what to what phenomenologists say. That that is a certain research program. Of course, I am a fan of phenomenology, so I also think that phenomenology is right about a number of things. But I, I they, those are different different answers to the situation. Of course, because for example, the problem of the, re represent a re uh, representationalism mm. that was uh, Michel was saying. It, it, we know there's a lot of problem coming from this. And we still talk like that, we still use it, we still teach it, and we know that a lot of difficulties come from not, not questioning this idea. But in general epistemology, we do that all the time, because a subject uh, react, trust another subject, saying blah, 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 and it's not always in the representation scheme. It's, more complicated than that. It's it's the authority, it's the trust, it's all kind of other factors entering in knowledge. In general epistemology, not in philosophy of science. So let me also answer to this point. So we don't have a fully developed phenomenological theory of knowledge. Mm. <laughs> we don't. And I believe I also in my book, there is a small chapter about, about this, that there are very critical points in which you just cannot follow Husserl on the way he was doing it. That's, that's one thing. So, the kind of exercise that I'm doing here is, of course, from a phenomenological standpoint, I believe that there are a number of fundamental insights that are correct, etc. But what I'm, I'm trying to do, what I'm doing, is also is also using phenomenology in order to develop a self-awareness of our philosophical present. So I'm taking seriously the idea that we are in a philosophical, in the aftermath of a crisis, in a sense. I'm taking seriously, and I, and I think that this analysis, this form of understanding, as much as we, that one can do the philosophy of science, so we can, we must, understand philosophically the situation of philosophy today and try trying to study the practice of philosophy today. And, and, and phenomenology is extremely helpful to do it. <coughs> yes. 
Yes. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, the great talk. Um, I myself am not a phenomenologist, um, but I've been told that my philosophy of mathematics is quite uh, <laughs> phenomenological in nature. Um, Say again, sorry. I've been told that my philosophy of mathematics is, it has a strong uh, phenomenological uh, 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 smell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully, it's 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 hopefully, it's it's hopefully it works. Uh, well, that's up to other people to. So I'm, 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 I feel like I, sh I should still uh, get into, into better understanding with uh, at some point. Um, so my question is also very na naive. Um, but I was just wondering about how, um, how all these things translate from science in the time of Whistle to science now. Mm. Can we still treat it in the same way? Uh, is it still the same crisis? Did it get uh, uh, deepened? Uh, is it still is much worse, the crisis? Um, uh, that sort of questions. And um, should we be very careful, maybe, to uh, just try to use his tools, his uh, conceptual schemes, in science that has evolved, uh, good or bad, so much uh, in, in these, these, uh, these years? And related to that, maybe, but maybe my question gets too big. But um, um, I was thinking about this pre-scientific uh, knowledge mm -hmm. that is so central. Um, can we still say that an individual individual can have such a thing? Is there still s something today that would be pre-scientific, given that we live in a time that is so heavily shaped by? science and technology and everybody has heard something of something and if you get a teacher in high school they will also they will be framed by some some scientific ideas and so the knowledge that you would normally pre theoretically pre scientifically have um, is polluted so to say by all prejudices of of science and misunderstood science of generations that have come before us that exists without a doubt or already in Husserl's time, but is there properly pre-scientific knowledge around? Thank you. So two <coughs> questions. So the first one, actually it's, it's even double in itself because it contains first the idea, <coughs> to what extent the um, analysis of the crisis is still actual and to what extent the kind of work that he was doing is still actual. And they are two different questions and actually I think they don't have the same answers. I think that the diagnosis is very much valid today as it is. Because if you start from what he wanted and, and if, you, if you go back to the idea that in our civilization there is this dream <laughs> Of a, of, a, of a fundamental philosophy, of a universal philosophy. And you, then of course, you, we can discuss about the details, how this happened, etc. But that, that diagnosis of our situation as a post epistemic world, in a sense, in a strong sense, hmm? or I think it's, it's, it's absolutely valid. It's, and, and, and the sciences, no, the sciences, the sciences, also the new sciences, they are, they are, they are in this. And the discourse that scientists do about what they do, they are in this. You know, there are chunks of metaphysical claims that come from neuroscientists, that come from also whenever the newspapers you, you read all these kind of chunks of metaphysical claims that, that seems to be all of a sudden to stem from this or that discovery. And that's immediately where you see that sorry, no, it's, it's just we can't do that, you know. With the fact that we have this wonderful thing that are the science, it doesn't mean that, that immediately you can, you, can, you can think that you disclose this ultimate truth about reality. It doesn't work like that. And, and the, the, it's a little bit less clear, and, 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 and it's only very, 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 very only to an extent that what Husserl actually did could be applied as such to what is being done now. And my favorite example in this is, 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 is even the theory of relativity. I, I struggle with seeing exactly how he would, he would although he, he thinks that he would be able to do it, but I, I have really problem saying, mm, understanding how he could, he could make a satisfactory treatment of that. It's easier in the case of quantum mechanics, I believe, but that's, but that's easier. I think, I think it is, but it's that's, but that's, that's, that's another, that's another story. But so I would, non-Euclidean geometries, hmm. non-Euclidean geometries, I think. 
Yeah, sure. But the problem is more is a, is a physical use that is really that is really problematic. If if you see what Husserl says, rather than the abstract theory that that he could quite easily accept that he did accept. So um, the the last question that's that's a that's a very interesting question that is often posed about about the the notion of, of life. Or actually, Husserl has a, a word to describe the phenomenon that 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 you that you mentioned, which is Einströmung. So it's the fact that precisely what is um, developed by, by, by sciences, or by culture in its production of representations and ideas, then it's sedimented back into the life world in such a way that also the experience of the world. So how do you, do you make an account of this? How do you still speak about the life world? Is the life world then gets polluted, as you said very well, or, or it, it gets sedimented with the products of, of scientific knowledge, because the, the fundamental point, I think that is simple point, that sometimes has been missed, is that what makes the life or the life word, which is the word, and there is not another word no, apart from the life word, is its mode of givenness, its fundamental way of being given, and the structure of givenness, mm -hmm. and that doesn't change, and that doesn't change. So it's 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 if you if you ask yourself in the first place how it is that we can speak about a world that it is there and it's there for all of us together. The form of this doesn't change, although the content does. And so the, 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 the no matter how much we speak about, you know, oh I have to eat carbohydrates or I you know I haven't eaten enough uh, amino acids uh, over the past two weeks uh, or etc etc the the way of giving us of the world is unaffected from this. And it's the ultimate way of the, the constitution of objects in, in, in intuitive uh, structures it is not affected by it. And it's 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 impossible to, it's possible to remind us of this that a way of highlighting this quite clearly is this fiction that Rousseau makes that basically you can imagine a life world that is a life world and is able to be a life world to host our life and a coherent to understand social life, but it's not scientifically cognizable <laughs> because it's not well ordered enough. It's a fiction that I think it's really important that everybody should keep in mind, you know, that actually one thing is to say that there is a word and another thing is to say that it's scientifically cognizable, not because it is another one, but because actually being scientifically con cognizable means to behave in, in a certain way, <laughs> in a certain well-ordered way. That is just one of the possible ways in which reality can deploy itself, and so this possibility remains always there. So if you if you study there, what what you what you see basically is is always this this trick that Rousseau does in the crisis, and it's fascinating that episteme is, I would say in French it comes quite well, it's porté, but it's the episteme is is discloses within the world of doxa <laughs> and you cannot separate it from it the world of doxa is always there and it is a doxa it's, it's doxastic way of deploying itself doesn't change <coughs> more questions so I can't smile. <laughs> okay uh, one of the things that uh, was um, uh, interested with is this, this distinction that uh, we saw between the first level and the second level of uh, uh, metaphysics. Metaphysics, yes. Mm -hmm. Because one of the criticism that uh, led to uh, the more pragmatic attitude today in the physics science and practice and uh, mm -hmm. in Shang's philosophy mm -hmm. is a feminist critique and uh, all this idea that, uh, in a sense, uh, science is always affected by norms and by values and by affects. And Somewhat a uh, metaphysician that influenced uh, Cheng's uh, talks, but mm. the need to uh, take the Levinas turn to from from more modern, modern metaphysics, and I wonder how it would fit into Husserl's world at all. No, <laughs> I what I thought mm. actually. No, no, I, I understand. I understand the problem. I'm not underplaying it and its validity, absolutely. But I mean. Mm. As it is, uh, at theory of science, who's a theory of science, as it is, would not, would, would consider any kind of uh, 
influence, extra logical <laughs> influence on the development of science as, as bad. Mm. That it exists in fact, he wouldn't he wouldn't need to deny it at all. Because you know, because given given the state we are in, it would be to be expected. So the the, the only way I would I would I would fit if if, if you really want to be a Serbian, of course you don't have to, but if you want to be a Serbian, then you would say, but look, of course, given that there is something like the crisis of sciences, given that we do science the way we do, and that's the science that we have, then yes, then it's a kind of also a kind necessarily also very much tainted by all sorts of subjective influence that ideally you wouldn't want. Mm -hmm. And so science as it is can also be the meeting point of a number of ideologies and stuff as it is to an extent. To an extent. But of course the goal is to is to get rid of that. <laughs> in, for him. Yeah. Uh, in that in that sense. So if you want to, to combine the, the two approaches, then you have to change the aim. So you can use uh, the, the, the language that also provides uh, the, the connection between the scientific and the pre-scientific, the meaning of the doxastic, the, all the, and you have to, in a sense, use it for a different purpose. Isn't that like a Linnaeus project in a way? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Only that, to my knowledge, it wasn't particularly related to the sciences, but no. I mean, it's, that's, that's, if that's, 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 that's what you, that's what you mean, <laughs> if it is what you mean. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Alexa? Mm. No. 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 Yeah, the, the distinction between, because it seems that you sort of take it together scientific knowledge and technology. Mm. Because scientific knowledge change, mm. technology stays. It's not because you changed your quantum mechanics that, mm. you know, telegraph stopped working even if you don't interpret at all how, how it's working. So of course, when you see it uh, in an objectivist way, it's it's a mystery because you change representation, so you change completely what you know about the world, and still, all telegraph works. <laughs> mm -hmm. We build technology today that probably everything we based on we use today to build them will be false, and we will still use this technology if it. It's work. So, so how does it work? This uh, the technique, the relation between te the technology, so the technical knowledge mm -hmm. compared to theoretical knowledge in, in yourself. No, I'm not entirely sure. Because that's that. another that's another thing you could add to your critique that yeah. falls field science pretty bad <laughs> to treat today. No. I'm not entirely sure that in this respect they would be so different, though. I'm not okay. in, in that in that because I mean this, but. It also is not Heidegger, so it doesn't it doesn't have this this theory for which actually philosophically speaking is technology that is the decisive phenomenon. So in that respect, he's he's more uh, he has a quite a classical position in the sense that practical technology is a an offshoot of theoretical knowledge, at least when you have in place uh, sophisticated science, not before, obviously. And insofar as, so if you want to, insofar as a theory have a domain of applications in which it, it, it works, like classical physics works for simple mechanical macroscopic, not only simple, but me me mechanical phenomena, or Maxwell theory works for macroscopic, um, etc., etc., electromagnetic phenomena. If they have a domain of application that allows also domain of technological application regulated by these theories. So the moment in which, that, that's why I think it's a little bit also the point that he makes at the beginning of the crisis, you know. Mm -hmm. Classical physics is superseded, yes, as a theory, but we use it continuously mm -hmm. and we learn it and it works beautifully. And it's, it still is science and, 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 and of course you can, you can build so um, technology in the real sense of the word is not affected necessarily by, by the change, the changes that happen in, in, in the history of sciences, and even less so by the, by the um, foundational work of phenomenology in, 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 in that respect. The problem, 
with respect to technology is for Rousseau is a problem of ethical regulations rather than anything else. <laughs> it's a problem of ethical regulations. So it's okay. So there's no autonomy of technology at all. I know there are, there are interesting studies today about how technology actually doesn't really need so much theory to work. I, I was it's hoping because, because yeah, that, no, that's a okay, problem I today see, for I us. See the for us it's a problem today. Yeah. No, <laughs> we no, no, don't no. know how to treat that. I mean, well. No, I don't think, I don't think he, 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 that's, that, is, that, that is a big area today to see how technology. Yeah, okay. Yeah. More questions? So, so I can give you another one. A question about the Another heresy of Husserl's. Uh, one of uh, the reasons why people today uh, prefer Merleau Ponty to, uh, mm. to uh, Husserl's for, for future science or future science mm. project is because they think that Husserl falls too, too easily to the myth of the given. Mm. The value of the thing that is given itself and, uh, mm. for more lots of reasons. Do you think that it's a real critique, or do you have reasons to believe it? No, I don't. I don't. I mean, that would require, of course, a, another talk. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess, yes, that's, that's a classical answer. That's a way of saving myself. So uh, that this would require, I use this card, this would require another talk. But I think it really would require another talk. Yeah. And, 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 and it's, it's interesting. I, I, that would really require understanding what also means by given. And I think it is some, somehow a bit oversimplified. Okay. And I always find myself, I have struggled with Merleau Ponty again uh, in, in, in more than one occasion, and I don't find him compelling. <laughs> I don't find him compelling. Interesting though, absolutely. But you will so have to treat it when you were doing your Hegelian comparison. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you may, you're welcome to play the card again. Mm. But one thing that, and I, I had a similar question because mm. um, this is a, a mm -hmm. the only Husserl I've, I've, I've engaged a tiny bit with his, with his work on mathematics, but, but not, mm. not this stuff. Um, A lot seems to be riding on this idea that we can have truths that we of which we do not understand the sense. Mm. And I just wanted to ask you to say a little bit more. Again, I'm sure that I'm sure clarifying what Husserl means when he said that yeah, also yeah. could have been another hour long talk. Yeah, yeah, sure. But um, but give me give, give me another least, give I me five at minutes. Least, at least that this was this is this is part of this talk. It's not <laughs> another talk. So the the word sense in Husserl has many meanings, and we don't need to go through all of them. <laughs> One is the one that appears in the compound Sein Sein, Sein Sein, which is translated sometimes as sense of being, which I think is what how it should do. Sometimes it's translated as being sense. Sometimes it's tra in the translator of the crisis shows something like ontic meaning that I think makes it quite obscure. And basically, what what did? What I mean by that is basically when you do the theory of constitution and, and you study how different objects constitute themselves. If, if cat each category of object has a, has, a, has a way of constituting. You know? So if you, if you take a classic example of the material objects, it will constitute through a series of layers, like first simply the, what he calls the, the schema, so what you would just see, for instance, with one sense, and it's just seen as, as, a, as a simple schema, then the synthesis of the schema, then you, you have to experience the causal behavior of the objects. And in that case, you simply don't have a perceptual schema, but you could have a schema that behave harmoniously with a number of causes, etc., etc. When he describes this, basically, it's, at the end, if all of this happens under your eyes. Those are the conditions under which you say that the object is. Is. Then the object is there. If, if I see this and then I put my hands and it gets through it, mm -hmm. then I don't think that it is. 
So describing all this condition whereby the object, as you say, say, legitimates itself, is describing its condition for which it is legitimate to say that it is, and the form of its way of legitimizing its being, it's called Zainzim, it's its sense of being, okay? And so the point is that each region of objects has a different way of constituting itself, therefore is a different being sense. Like an, an experience does not legitimize itself as an external object. An experience doesn't have causal properties, it doesn't appear from different angles. I cannot see the same experience from different angles, etc., etc. So much of this work is precisely that if you want, what we were saying before, if you want to understand what a science speaks about, it means that you have to understand the sense of being of the objects that they really, and that's, that, that is what also goes going back to the things themselves, you know. It's really looking, looking at what, how, what is the intuitive mode of manifestation of the objects a science is about. That's, that's going back to the things themselves. Yeah, I have no question, I think we can go forward, yeah? No question, no? So let's take some speaker again.